I have been keeping glow worms for quite some time now. I want to briefly share how I do this. Now, I do realize this will be useful to very few people, but for those, it might be really useful. I do not want to promote glowworms and fireflies as pets. Most of the time, you will be dealing with creepy crawly larvae. Also, their light isn't all that impressive, or enduring, at least not in the species Lampreus sardinia. But even with other lamprey species, you most likely won't be able to put their luminescence into any meaningful use. Look for romantic lighting in other directions. To enjoy raising these insects, you basically have to be obsessed about lampreys. I mean, uh, really enthusiastic about them. Although I used this setup with some success also for other species, Lampyrus sardinia is the species this setup is really tried and true for. These glowworms originate, big surprise I know, from the island of Sardinia. Back in 2004, I was able to obtain a few larvae from that Mediterranean island. Now, in 2016, the 17th generation of their offspring has hatched. Since most of their lifespan is taken up by the larval stage, keeping glowworms is mostly keeping their larvae. For this purpose, I simply use airtight clip boxes sold for keeping food fresh. Because they are airtight, there won't be any gaps between lid and box. For proper ventilation, I punch some holes in the middle of the lid and open the boxes during regular inspections. My substrate of choice are moist, biodegradable sponge cloths. They are composed of cellulose and stabilized with the cotton net and can soak up and store water real good. For a long time, I was using coconut fiber bricks that you soak in water to create a nature-like substrate. They are sold for terrariums and as a plant soil. Sure, it looks nice, but the biggest problem is that larvae are often left behind when putting the inhabitants into a freshly prepared container. They just hide in and under the coconut stuff, so I had to keep the old boxes around for quite some time to make sure I really transferred all the larvae. Other problems are that it is somewhat hard to judge its freshness. It has about the same color as glowworm poo. And dark-winged fungus gnats like to use it for breeding. Also, the substrate can get a little bit messy to handle. But back to the sponge cloths. After a thorough wash with clear water, squeeze them out well so they are moist but not dripping wet. Rip them to shreds and arrange them in the box. I do not advise to cover the whole bottom of the box with just one piece, as larvae might be trapped underneath it. And that's basically all there is to this setup. Larvae are skilled escapists, especially the very young ones. Those might even reach the air holes in the middle of the lid. So you might want to secure these holes by taping a cotton pad over them. Shallow spoons, like those used for ice cream, are nice for picking up single or a few larvae. However, with this setup, you don't have to pick up larva after larva. For a cleanup, you simply prepare a fresh box and then you transfer the larvae easily and quickly like this. Though, not that quickly. This footage is sped up 8 times. Just take each piece of the sponge cloth and gently push or shake the larvae off into the new container. Lightly blowing on them makes them loosen their grip or even drop down by themselves. Junk like excrement, noticeable as soaked in brown stains, shed skins and even food remnants, okay maybe apart from big empty snail shells, will almost completely stay on the cloth. Those larvae that are not sticking to the sponge cloth can even be more easily transferred, simply by shaking them loose and pouring the heap of larvae in. Okay, now I'm going to talk about feeding the larvae. The fact is, firefly larvae are actually quite nasty little predators. So, if you're not comfortable with the harsh realities of the food chain, you might want to pass. To give you a hint, let Hannibal Lecter, of all people, introduce you about their diet. In episode 5 of season 3 of the TV series Hannibal, he reminisces. I kept cochlear gardens as a young man to attract fireflies. 
Their larvae would devour many times their own weight in snails. Fuel To power a transformation into a delicate creature of such beauty. His female companion then proposes a toast to the misfortune of the snail. Well, in the show they used North American fireflies, mostly CGI, and one shot of a real beetle. Those actually feed on earthworms. Lampyrus sardinia will eat chopped up earthworms as well. But like the fireflies that Hannibal really would have had in his cochlea gardens, Lampyrisa splendidula by the way, Lampyrus sardinia is more at home feasting on snails and slugs. A word of caution about slugs. They might turn the tables and return the favor, as they are able to feed on freshly molted larvae. If you want to play it safe, only provide them cut into pieces. I prefer feeding snails. Since the opening of the shell limits how many larvae can feed on a snail, I sometimes feed them crushed snails. This way even young larvae can tackle fully grown garden snails in a kind of communal feeding. Yes, there's actually a snail under all these larvae. If snails and slugs are hard to find outside, for instance in winter, aquatic snails are an excellent source of nutrition. Apple snails were a nice treat, well, at least until they got banned in the EU here, because apparently some invasive species of them had been munching on Italian rice paddies. Also, the near-constantly produced offspring of giant African land snails make a good food. And yes, one of my breeding specimens had three eye stalks. Basically, boxes for adults can be the same as for the larvae. I like to keep them a bit less humid than the larvae boxes and provide a thorough aeration. It is good to have a little more height and something to crawl on to encourage the female's glowing behavior. Under these conditions, even the male might crawl up to an elated position and start a short flight, but in general, the males appear to be somewhat lazy flyers. Small terrariums for mantises are a very fancy option. Butterfly cages with a very fine gauze might work for extended flight maneuvers. Oh, and by the way, no need for feeding. The adults have atrophied mouthparts. They subsist on reserves accumulated as larvae. This is why they only live for a few weeks at best. I just keep my boxes at normal room temperature and in indirect natural light. I never really try to hibernation during winter. However, I allow the room to be somewhat cooler in winter and the days are automatically shorter since I prefer natural light. This is the care routine. Adjusting humidity. Prevent excessive condensation droplets or even small puddles of water, but at the same time never let the sponge cloth dry out. It usually keeps enough moisture until a fresh one is applied anyway. Feeding. About once a week for very young larvae. Older ones are fine with the meal every few weeks or maybe once a month. This is a well-fed larva. Note the bloated appearance and the stretch mark, so to speak, between the dorsal plates. The stretch mark is more pronounced in young larvae. Hungry larvae will roam the box, especially at the edges, with questing head movements. No separate water sources need to be given. Only really dehydrated larvae, like this escapee here, will drink from droplets or water-soaked stuff. Hygiene. Collecting food remnants, shed skins, etc. as needed. Pincers are nice for that. In case of bigger messes, transfer to a fresh box as shown beforehand. A few words about the breeding procedures. I store the pupae separated by sex and let them hatch. These are females. And here are the males. Easy to distinguish from the females by their big eyes and fully developed wings. Some days after shedding the chrysalis, the mating can take place. I usually wait until the female shows its glowing behavior before I introduce the males to it. With good timing, many breeder individuals can produce a large clutch of eggs together. But even if kept semi-wild in a nature-like terrarium with all stages and sexes mixed, reproduction can be successful. 
However, under controlled conditions, it is preferable to separate the sexes after mating again, so the females can lay their eggs undisturbed. After about a month, the larvae will hatch, but some eggs may take longer to develop. The growth of the larvae is quite pronounced. These are the first four stages in comparison. And this is the first stage next to a mature larva shortly before pupation. Well, those are the basics of how I keep my glow one colony. Maybe more detailed videos to come. That's it for now. Cheers to the misfortune of the snail.